Hey everybody, welcome to Top 5 Things to Jumpstart Your ICD-10 Transition. Uh, my name is Danny Flint with Complete Practice Resources and this is the uh, first in a, a series of webinars that Brown and Tolan will be providing um, it's affiliated physician practices for the ICD-10 transition. Uh, our company has been all ICD-10 all the time for the last three years. We've uh, been in front of thousands of, of practices just like yours. We're one of the few companies in the country uh, to have uh, um, already accomplished over 50 ICD-10 implementations. So what you're going to hear today is, to our mind, the best way to go from 0 to 60 uh, in the ICD-10 transition in about 30 days. We're going to talk about simple, achievable steps. And this, this really speaks to what we've learned when we've been out and about um, in literally dozens of workshops over the last, just the last month and a half or so. We're finally to a point where most practices understand ICD-10 is coming. It's not going to be delayed. Uh, CMS has made that pretty clear. The government is absolutely committed. The payers are ready. So, so most practices understand it's coming and there's nothing we can do about it. But what we see out on the road is that there's really not a clear sense of what to do or how to get started. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, as far as an overview of, of, of the webinar today, we're going to talk about a little background and foundation just to the extent that you have a, a good solid idea of what ICD-10 looks like and, and why uh, we have to go ICD-10. I don't want to spend too much on that because I really want to get into the nuts and bolts of, of, of accomplishable steps that you all can take today. Uh, once you understand what it looks like with the background and foundation, we'll move into uh, impact. We'll talk about three areas, reimbursement, productivity, and operations. Uh, so that you have a real clear sense of as you go through your practice and you start identifying those ICD-10 impact areas, you'll find, for example, that this is not just an EHR issue. It's not just a coding challenge. Uh, ICD-10 cuts across the entire continuum of your practice, and I think when we start talking about that impact, uh, you'll see. Uh, and then we'll move right into the top five things you need to do to get your your, your um, ICD-10 implementation implemented and kick-started right away. You'll hear me all day long talk about documentation as the cornerstone for success. If, if there's an elevator speech about ICD-10, it's really simple. At, at its very root core, basically what ICD-10 is, doctors got to write down more stuff. There's just a, a huge increase. We call it a dramatic increase in specificity from ICD-9 to ICD-10. So with that comes an increase in the documentation elements required. So we're going to talk a lot about how to get your docs engaged and how to get them educated and how to get them in the game. And it's all about really taking simple steps to demystify ICD-10 for them. Uh, you know, human nature is such that people avoid what they don't understand, and that's certainly true of ICD-10 in regards to the physicians. So we're, again, we're going to talk a lot about clinical documentation improvement. Uh, to the extent that that documentation is the cornerstone for success. And then finally, we'll close with some of the expected outcomes for efficiency and quality. You know, ICD-10 is not all bad. It's not, it's not the monster in the closet everybody makes it out to be. So certainly there's a lot of, of short-term pain as we go through this significant change in how we do business, but the long-term benefits are such that they really need to be discussed, and, and you might not have heard about some of those. So, so let's talk about a little background for ICD-10. ICD-10 was published by the World Health Organization in 1992. Uh, that's the version the rest of the world uses. However, in the United States, because of our unique payer model, we don't use ICD-10. We don't use ICD-9. We use the clinical modifications, ICD-9-CM, ICD-10-CM. So it's important to understand that the version of ICD-10 that, that the United States will be using is a lot different than the rest of the world. And by the way, it took seven years to, uh, to develop the clinical modifications on the original uh, ICD-10 uh, code set that was released by the World Health Organization in 1992. <laughs> oh my gosh, excuse me. And by the way, um, while we're talking about this, what else did the WHO release? I'll just give you a second to think about that. What else did the WHO release? If you said Tommy or Pinball Wizard or won't get pulled again, you got that question right. Remember, this is ICD-10. It's hard to make fun. So, um, you know, we'll, I'll tell you lots of lame jokes. I, it's a webinar, so I can't tell if you're groaning or laughing, but um, hopefully it'll break it up a little bit. Uh, people ask, why do we have to go ICD-10? Well, simply stated, this all started back with HIPAA in 1996. 
Uh, you know, we think about HIPAA in terms of protecting private in information or you have taking your insurance with you when you change jobs. But something else HIPAA was doing behind the scenes was it was creating standardized rules and regulations for electronic transactions and code sets. So the, the HIPAA mandate is really what, what makes this something that can't be changed literally without an act of Congress. So October 1st, 2014 is the compliance date. Uh, you know, it's been delayed twice already. Uh, Mill and Tabiner has already said they're not going to delay it again. So October 1st, 2014 is the, is the date we have to deal with. Um, we're the last industrialized nation to implement ICD-10. So we've got a lot of good anecdotal information from other countries who've gone before. Uh, ICD-10 comes in two parts, ICD-10-CM and ICD-10-PCS. We're only going to be talking about ICD-10-CM today. ICD-10-PCS is only for use in inpatient hospital procedure code settings. So only for procedure coding in inpatient hospital uh, settings. So I'm going to talk about those. Uh, you can see we're going up uh, in the numbers of codes. We've got about 14,000 codes in ICD-9. We're going up to 69,000 codes in ICD-10. And again, the, the, the key thing to remember about ICD-10 is just this, this again, this, this increase in, in specificity. Um, the whole code look is changing. We're going from three to five digits in ICD-9. Uh, and an ICD-10 code contains three to seven alphanumeric characters. And you might remember that 5010 conversion we had to go through by January 1st, 2012. The reason we had to go to that new data format was because the ICD-10 code set was so different. It's often American. The old data format couldn't, uh, couldn't support it. Uh, what's the latest news from the road? Well, again, uh, we're hearing a lot out of Washington. The work group for electronic data interchange called WEEDI. Uh, the WEEDI meets about once a month. They've got um, representation from all the different stakeholders, payers, providers, vendors. And what we're hearing out of Weedy is that the payers are going to be ready for ICD-10. Now, that's not to say they're going to be ready for testing, but they're going to be ready. So that, that doesn't bode well for providers who are not, not going to be ready. Uh, June 1st, 2014, that's kind of the ICD-10 date no one is talking about. At a national payer panel, United, Blue Cross, and Aetna all said that on June 1st, they'll start requiring ICD-10 codes for the pre-authorization, and this is pre-authorization only for surgeries and services conducted on and after October 1st. So, you know, again, I want to say that again. June 1st, pre-authorization only, ICD-10 codes for everything you're doing uh, requiring a pre-authorization or prior authorization October 1st and beyond. So what that tells us, we, we've got to be far enough down the ICD-10 road to even be able to submit ICD-10 codes if we need to for, uh, for pre-authorization. Uh, again, everything we're hearing out of, the, out of the government, Department of Health and Human Services and CMS, ICD-10 will happen on time. Uh, the most recent idea that we, we got that was uh, Marilyn Tabiner, the acting administrator for CMS. She uh, addressed uh, the HIMSS National Conference about three weeks ago on Friday, and, and she said there will be no more delays. The ICD-10 compliance date is set, and it will not change. So. I know you've got a lot of providers in your organization, and there are a lot of providers out there that are pushing back and saying, ah, oh, it's the government, it's just going to be delayed again. Uh, we don't think that's going to happen, and certainly everything we're hearing says that October 1st is a date they are absolutely committed to. So you, you don't want to get to you know, August or September of this year without having done a, a lot of work on your ICD-10 transition. You're putting your, your practice at great financial peril if you're not ready to go. The timeline that it takes to accomplish an ICD-10 implementation project from CMS was estimated to be 15 to 18 months long, and we're now we've now got about seven months. Uh, so again, we've got to compress a lot of the work that we should have started a year ago, and we're going to show you how to do that today. Uh, the North Carolina test project that we conducted in North Carolina, they took uh, 100 or so practices and put them through an ICD-10 implementation, and uh, it, the results were worse than anticipated. The drop in productivity was, was uh, dramatic. Um, you know, those co countries who've gone before experienced about a 20% drop in productivity. So this is a whole new system, and, and again, it cuts across the entire continuum of your practice. So it's, it's not just an internal project. It's everybody 
uh, to whom you enter an order. It's all your referrals. It's your vendors. It's your payers. So it's going to slow down, and, and the drop in productivity, which we'll talk about in a little bit uh, more detail later, is, is going to be pretty severe. Uh, what's our view from the road? Again, the, the one-year delay did a disservice to our doctors, and it caused a lot of uncertainty and paralysis and inactivity. So what do you have to do to get started? That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, why do we need ICD-10 in the first place? Well, simply stated, ICD-9 is outdated. A lot of the categories in the code books, the disease categories in the ICD-9 code book, they're full. We, can, we don't even have room to add new codes. So this is all about your data. Uh, your, your coding, if you think about your coding both in the CPT environment and in ICDs, that's kind of your, your public face to the outside world. So they want more specific data. They meaning the government, the payers. Um, obviously those who develop treatment protocols, the better data we have, the, the better health care we can, we can provide. Uh, and ICD-10 allows us to do that. So a coding system needs to be, again, flexible enough to quickly incorporate emergency, emerging diagnoses and exact enough to precisely identify those diagnoses. As far as the code structure, again, we're going from three to five numbers to three to seven alphanumeric characters. And let's just run through some examples. Uh, I'm going to pull up a, a software, conversion software that we use. You don't, you know, obviously you don't need conversion software to handle the ICD-10 transition. It certainly helps. It's a big time saver, but this is just one we use. Uh, let's take a look at the fracture of the patella. In ICD-9, pretty simple. There are only two codes, open and closed. Does anybody want to guess how many codes exist for the same description in ICD-10? And I'll just give you a second to think about it. I will say the most common answer is 20, 25, 30. The actual answer in ICD-10 for the same description, 480 codes. So we're going from 2 to 480. And, and this is where we lose the doctors. Uh, you know, we get a lot of pushback in live settings. The docs will say, well, that's absurd. That's ridiculous. I'm not going to do it. Or, or the status statement I hear is, thanks a lot, Denny. Now I know the date of my retirement. Uh, but that's because they're focused. It's not where you need to focus. It's all about the documentation. So watch what happens when I just add a few required new documentation elements for ICD-10. We know, for example, that ICD-10 requires laterality within the code. So if I just put the term right, we're down to 160 results. Uh, for orthopedics, we have to report within the ICD-10 code the type of fracture. So we'll just call it a transverse fracture of the right patella. Now I'm down to 32 results. A lot of ICD-10 codes, and we're talking orthopedics and otherwise, most specialties, you have to, you have to report the type of encounter. Um, so you've got three choices, initial, subsequent, and sequela. So if I just put an initial encounter for a transverse fracture of the right patella and I search again, now I'm down to only six results. So by, by adding only three documentation elements that you're going to know anyway, we went from 480 to only six. And that's the point. Docs don't need to concentrate or focus on the number of codes. It's all about the documentation elements. So, and you can see in looking at, at the rest of these descriptors, if I just put displaced or non-displaced and open or closed, I have the exact code. So it, it's fun to do these kinds of conversions for the physicians because the doctors look at this and, and you can see their shoulders relax, their whole posture changes. And they say, OK, I get it. It's not that bad. I've got to write down more stuff. Uh, so, you know, this is getting a little bit ahead of the program here, but, you know, that's why the very first most important thing you need to do to kickstart your ICD-10 transition is to take your top 20 or 30 most frequently used ICD-9 codes and convert them to ICD-10 so you know what you're dealing with. And I'll show you some of those in a little bit. Um, so, uh, again, the whole structure changes, the specificity changes, and therefore the, the requisite requirement for documentation changes as well. Uh, let's talk about impact. Now that you know what this looks like, the following areas will either be positive or negative depending on how well you handle the transition. So let's take a look at insurance reimbursement impact first. Um, clearly the, the existing reimbursement issues are, are going to carry over to ICD-10. In fact, they're just going to get worse. Because of that new specificity, you're going to see a big increase in your medical necessity denials. And if you're not in billing, basically what medical necessity means is you submitted a, uh, a very complicated procedure service CPT code, 
and you're trying to justify that with maybe a low level, um, low acuity level diagnosis code. So you're submitting a 99215 with something like uh, low back pain or something like that. So again, those medical necessity denials are certainly going to increase if you don't embrace the new specificity. So that's why it's so important to get that, that documentation that's the foundation for everything else so that you can specifically choose codes that get you paid. Um, obviously, other insurance reimbursement impact, you've all heard about you know, in the Obama plan, things like value-based reimbursement. We've already been under the physician quality reporting system for a while. Uh, basically, what those two things are is, is doctors are no longer going to be paid based on what they do, but how well they prove they can do it. Uh, so value-based reimbursement, PQRS, directly tied to ICD-10 and the specificity of that, that code choice. You don't want to have your public face to the, the outside world as, a, as an unspecific practice who's unsophisticated and doesn't really know what's wrong with your patients. That won't bode well in the, in the value-based reimbursement system. As far as the future of, of reimbursement, you know, these accountable care organizations are popping up all over the country. And basically, it's a co-op between the payers and the providers whereby a certain patient population is assigned to that ACO and that organization has to manage the care for the population assigned. Well, right now, if you're in an ACO and you're being paid on a per claims basis, that's okay because that's what you're that, because that's what we're, we're used to. Basically, you submit a claim, you perform a procedure or service, you get paid for what you submit. Under the, the future reimbursement models of ACO, however, ICD-10 plays a big part because we're going to start going more and more capitated where you're going to get a certain amount capitata from the Latin meaning per head, you're going to get a certain amount of money per head for that patient population. But right now, you can't really assess the risk of the population that you're taking on. With ICD-10, with a year or two of data under our belts, we'll have a lot better idea of exactly what kind of risk an ACO is taking on and therefore make a lot more uh, uh, informed decisions, which is, is going to be important. Unspecified basically will equal unpaid if you don't have uh, the ability to, to specifically code. Uh, so for example, um, here's a, a quote from a guy named Dennis Winkler from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. He's the Director of Technical Program Management. And, and this, this was a quote he gave on Talk 10 Tuesday. And I asked him if we could use it, and he said, sure. He said, physicians may be ICD-10 compliant, but if they abuse the other or unspecified codes, payment will not occur if a more specific alternative exists. So they are really going to look closely at the specificity of your uh, coding in order to justify payment. So make sure you, you meet that medical necessity and clinically justify what you're doing by specifically coding. Now, I'm not saying never submit an unspecified code. Certainly, patients will leave your, your practice justifiably unspecified because you're waiting for pathology to come back or you're waiting for specialists. Uh, consultative reports. And that's okay. The unspecified in that case is okay. What I'm talking about is maybe a, a two or three year patient you've been treating uh, who's got uh, uncontrolled diabetes unspecified. You know, the insurance company is going to have a hard problem with that because they're going to say, really, after two years, you don't know what, you know, what type of diabetes or what kind of uh, comorbidity or associated uh, underlying diseases that they have as well. So that's where, those are the kinds of instances where you're going to get in trouble. As far as productivity impact, again, 20% loss was the average for those countries who've gone before. And keeping in mind we're the last industrialized nation in the world to go ICD-10, and, and you know we have a lot more complicated system. We have multi-payer systems, not single-payer socialized medicine. Uh, we have a lot more complicated code set because of the clinical modification strap-on. So again, we've, we've got a, a, a drop in productivity. Uh, that was validated in the WeD test programs. Canada, Canada experienced a 50% drop in coding productivity alone. So this is something you've got to plan for. Now, I will argue that you can beat these numbers if you're adequately prepared. And that's why it's so important to get everybody going right now. Uh, denied claims will increase the ripple effect. We want to avoid that. Nothing is more uh, disheartening or frustrating for me as a consultant than going into a practice and seeing the same mistakes committed over and over and over again in, in the claim submittal that could have been fixed so that they don't perpetuate. So with ICD-10, after October 1st, it's going to be really important to monitor your denials. 
you know, there's going to be a lot of new wacky payment policies the insurance companies are going to pull out. Uh, so you know, stay on top of those. That ripple effect means you get a claim denied, you have to go back to the doctor, get it redocumented, you, you've got to update the EHR, you've got to recode, re, you know, resubmit the claim, refollow. It's just a, a rippling effect that should be avoided at all costs because ICD-10 is going to be uh, hard enough on your productivity as it is. And obviously there's a training impact on the ability to maintain workflow, and that's going to affect your productivity. You're all sitting here listening to this webinar right now. Who's doing your real job while you're being trained? So that's just a you know it's a common um, impact of, of of any training. You're not able to work while you're learning. So there's going to be a productivity impact. Uh, as far as operational impact, virtually every place a diagnosis code currently touches your practice you're going to have impact. So we're not talking about just internal impact. All of those what we call external stakeholders with whom you do business, and I'm talking uh, you know, clearing houses, outside billing companies, outside coding companies if you, if you use them, certainly your vendors. Anybody you enter an order to, whether it's uh, labs, imaging groups, PT, OT, DME, there's impact throughout with ICD-10. So that means you're going to have to have conversations with these external stakeholders and say, you know, hey, what are you all doing about ICD-10? Because we need to know. Our success depends on yours. We're going to talk a lot about vendor readiness a little bit later. But um, again, all those, those, those outside entities with whom you do business, there's ICD-10 impact there as well. Uh, anybody who is working with uh, pre-authorizations even, you know, the, the lowest level administrative person in your practice that calls insurance companies to get get claims pre-authorized, there's an impact there. there. There's a training component. They're going to have to learn the difference between ICD-9 and ICD-10. They're going to have to learn that some payers, like work comp, auto insurance, and disability, they don't even have to go ICD-10 because they're exempt from HIPAA. So they need to understand all of these nuances when it comes to ICD-10. So there's, everybody's going to need a little training. That's the point. Uh, as far as referrals, if I'm a, a primary care group and I'm referring out to my specialists, I want to have a conversation with them. Hey, what are you all doing about ICD-10? We're going to give you the most specific information we have, but in return, if we have to follow the care of our patient when you send them back to us, we'll require a very specific ICD-10 code because we're going to be a hostage to whatever code you give us until we determine otherwise. So again, the, the operational impact of ICD-10 cuts way across your own practice boundary. Now, reporting is another area that's that was uh, one of the biggest items identified by other countries that have gone before as a big impact area, and that's called data uh, comparability. Obviously, uh, in 2013, we had mostly ICD-9 data. In 2014, we've got nine months of nine data. We'll have three months of ICD-10 data. And then 2015, mostly ICD-10 data. So when you're looking at retrospective reporting especially, you know, how are you going to compare those apples to oranges? Uh, I used diagnosis reporting as a, a former CEO of a large multi-specialty group. I used diagnosis reporting to order supplies. Hey, how many, you know, how many indications of flu did we have last year? How many, you know, colleagues fracture splints do we need for, you know, the snowboarder accidents, et cetera? So there's a data comparability issue, and you have to know that going in. Um, as far as financial impact, this was this was a, a study done by Nockamson Advisors, Stanley Nockamson. Uh, is one of the most well-respected healthcare financial analysts in the country. Uh, he was commissioned by MGMA to do a, a study. What is ICD-10's financial impact? And, and these are the numbers he came up with. For the small practice, $83,000. For a medium practice, $285,000. And then for the large practice, $2.7 million. And that number was actually validated by the Cleveland Clinic. They've already implemented ICD-10. They've been ready to go for almost a year. Uh, their cost of, of ICD-10 upgrade was around $8 million across their enterprise. So this is not a small impact, and it should not be taken lightly. Now, I will argue, again, that you can beat these numbers. If you adequately prepare, if you listen to these webinars that Brown and Tolan is, 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 is conducting, uh, you know, if you get your doctors trained, your staff trained, uh, if you do some of the things we're going to talk about today, you can beat these numbers. What are the prevailing provider attitudes we have to overcome? Well, again, it's the government. Either it won't happen or it will be delayed again. It's happening. 
or it's just an IT and a coding issue, what's the big deal? It's not. It cuts across the entire boundary. For those of you who have been told your EHR vendor is going to handle your ICD-10 transition, I've yet to see an EHR vendor go negotiate a managed care contract that, that's going to change due to ICD-10. I've yet to see an, an EHR vendor come in and, and study the day-to-day -day impact and the workflow and the training requirements that are going to be required of your staff. Uh, EHR companies will, will be your most uh, important partner probably, but they're not the answer, and that's, that's the point. Uh, you know, another prevailing provider attitude is rack audits, meaningful use, ACOs, now ICD-10, I don't care, I'm retiring. You know, I'm, I'm getting old, please don't retire, we need you. <laughs> that's a prevailing provider impact, it's just too much. We're, we're piling on the physicians, and it's almost too much, but that being said, it's coming and we've got to get you ready. Uh, and then finally, the most, the single most, the, you know, the common thing that I hear on, on the road, we know it's coming, we just don't have a clear sense of what to do or how to begin. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, this is kind of the five phases of an ICD-10 transition, and, and I'm unclear most of you are probably still in phase one, and that's the kind of the educating and engaging phase. You can't really implement what people don't understand, so that's what phase one is all about, and that's why you're listening in on this, uh, this, this webinar today. Uh, phase two is kind of the get ready to get ready phase where you'll uh, you'll do the bulk of the work actually. That's where you get your team together, you'll do your impact assessment where you'll you'll write everywhere a diagnosis code touches and you'll start using that to help create your plan in phase three. Uh, if you do a good impact assessment, the plan kind of creates itself and we'll talk a lot about deadlines and accountabilities. Um, if you've got a good plan in place, implementing is easy. You just sit back and make sure everybody is doing what they're supposed to do on time. Uh, that's a little bit complicated because, again, you're dependent on outside entities for answers. So, for example, if, if you wait too long to ask your EHR vendor all the hard questions about ICD-10, they're probably not going to have time to answer you because you're in a long queue with a long line ahead of you. So that's why it's so important to get started. And then phase five is post-transition. You know, just because October 1st rolls around doesn't mean your work stops. In fact, that's where a lot of the hard work begins. So it's going to be important to monitor those metrics like revenue by payer, your denial reports obviously, provider productivity. Monitor that stuff so that you can quickly identify where problems occur and fix it. That's a five-phase transition. Now, what are the five steps to jumpstart the project? I'm going to kind of highlight and overview them, and then I'm going to illustrate each one. But, but again, the first three steps are all about getting the docs in the game. So what's number one? We talked about it before. Convert your top 20 codes and identify the new documentation elements. You know, find your ICD-10 reality. You'll, you know, maybe you'll find with your particular specialty, maybe there's a lot of one-to-one -one codes, the documentation elements don't change, and it's not that big a deal. Boy, wouldn't that be great? And there are, are a few specialties like that. I always get a kick out of talking to uh, obstetrics because with OB, you know, they, they have almost three times the number of ICD-10 codes. And they, they, they go nuts in the workshops when we, we show them that. They go, oh my gosh, we have three times the number of codes. Well, there's a simple reason for that. ICD-10 now requires you to report the trimester. So most of the codes are exactly the same. There's just more codes because you've got to identify first, second, or third trimester. So again, demystify ICD-10. Convert the codes, identify the new documentation elements, and then with step two, at the same time, Create some training tools. You know, I know some doctors uh, they'll respond to things like flashcards and and uh, and little training devices. But the you know the bottom line is find ways to to help your your physicians understand. This isn't about seventy thousand new codes. It's about a handful of new documentation elements and, and give them tools to help them learn that. The third thing is also a clinical documentation improvement step that helps get your doctors engaged. Perform simple chart reviews, and I'm, I'm not talking about full-blown chart audits here with CPT codes and modifiers and medical necessity, no. These are simple, and the steps are easy. The first thing you do after you convert your codes and identify the documentation elements, pull some charts, some current charts, and take a look at whether or not those current documentation in your current charts will support the future choice of a specific ICD-10 code from that ICD-9 conversion. And that's a great way to identify current documentation shortfalls. And where, where you're short, write it down. Give it to the providers. It's, there's no better, more powerful 
ICD-10 education venue or avenue than using codes the doctors actually use with charts they've actually created. It's a, it's a great way to illustrate what they need to know about ICD-10. And they're simple to do. You don't have to be a, a, a professional coder or anything like that. You just have to have some, some good anatomy and physiology background and the ability to look at a chart and say, wow, that doesn't contain all this new specific language that's contained in this ICD-10 code. Pretty simple. The fourth step to jumpstart your project, you've got to start talking about your key stakeholders, vendors and payers. Uh, I, I've had the good fortune to uh, address the MGMA conference in San Diego this, this fall, and I, was, I made it a point to walk around the trade show floor to talk to as many EHR vendors as I could about their ICD-10 readiness, and I was blown away by how not ready they are. Uh, but if you ask them, hey, are you guys going to be ready for ICD-10, they'll say, oh, yeah, we're going to release the code set next month. But that's not what you need. And by the way, you know, when they start giving you these code sets, uh, there's so much more to it. So you want to start asking hard questions, and I'm going to give you dozens of those during the course of this webinar. And then finally, prioritize your timeline and create deadlines and accountability. Uh, you know, a project plan is nothing more than a to-do list without deadlines and accountability. I have a lot of to-do lists on my refrigerator. They never get done because I don't make myself uh, accountable or give myself deadlines. And we'll show you easy ways to do that. You know, in, in doing 50 of these manually, we learn the hard way what not to do. Um, a manual conversion uh, to ICD-10 and implementation means dozens of Excel spreadsheets flying around that you have to manually update. Uh, you know, you have to manually track your calendars and completions. and and manually assigned tasks. There's easier ways to do it. We're going to show you some of those today. Um, providers, you hold the key to success. Without you, all project efforts are fruitless, and I'm going to beat this horse all day. Uh, again, the docs, at the end of the day, you can have the best team in place, the most well thought out plan. Um, you know, you can have uh, uh, the most uh, you know, thorough impact assessment, but at the end of the day, if the doctors don't give you the documentation you need, all those efforts are fruitless. That's why it's so important to get the physicians engaged. Your future financial health depends on it. And we already talked about ACOs and value-based reimbursement, everything that goes with it. It's no simpler, uh, uh, no, no more complicated a, a conversation than just saying, look, do you want to get your claims submitted and paid or not? Um, try the SOAP approach, subjective objective assessment plan. For the subjective part, ask them why there's so much pushback. Uh, you know, talk to them about the deadline. Talk to them about, you know, the loss of revenue. Those are subjective things. Objective and SOAP, the objective part of that is giving them that, that, that empirical data that they need to do their jobs. Don't talk to them about all the white noise surrounding the project. Just talk to them about documentation elements they need to learn and the simple things you need from them in order to achieve implementation success. As far as the assessment goes, let them assess it after you've given them all the information let them assess, but tell them you've got the plan down. You know, you've got a timeline developed. We're going we're gonna to convert some codes. We're going to give you the documentation elements you need. We're already talking to the vendors. You know, we're redoing our templates. Uh, we're talking to the payers. So we've got a plan, Doc. We've got your back, but we need your help. And, and at the end of the day, you might have to try the Jerry Maguire approach, which is, you know, help me help you. You know, Doc, you, you take great care of our patients. You take great care of us, the staff. But this is one we can't do alone. We need your help. So try the Jerry McGuire approach. And if all else fails, tell them we've got to go ICD-10 or we'll miss out on all these fun codes. Like uh, W18.12x, fall from or off toilet uh, with subsequent striking against an object. And, you know, we got to have ICD-10 because we need these codes because this stuff really happens. And by the way, both of these articles were from Ireland. I don't, I don't know why people are falling off toilets in Ireland. but. Um, Anyway, uh, W22.09XD, striking against other stationary objects. Doctor, we need ICD-10 because this stuff really happens. Like this. I told you ICD-10 was really hard to make fun, so there's a lot of lame jokes. Hopefully you're laughing and not groaning. I, I know I was supposed to open up with humor, and I, and I blew it. I forgot. I, I, I bombed on the very first step of public speaking. I'm supposed to get you laughing, but it's ICD-10. It's really hard. Here's a simple joke. I wanted to be a doctor, but I couldn't. I didn't have the patience. Anyway, how about this one? Y93.K2, activity milking a cow. You're probably not going to get hurt milking this cow, but 
But if the milking goes badly, there's a related W55.22XX, which is struck by cow, like this poor guy. Uh, I, was, I was doing a, a presentation to the Texas Medical Association's Winter Conference, and I had, I don't know, 400 or so physicians in the room. And, and when I showed this slide, this cute little old lady physician in the front row raised her hand, and I thought, wow, what a weird place to ask a question. I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, son, if your cow's got horns like that, I don't think you're milking it. <laughs> so I thought it was pretty funny. Anyway, I didn't grow up on a ranch, obviously. This one got a lot of press, D91.07XD, burn due to water skis on fire. I know most of you listening in are from Northern California, probably do a lot of water skiing. Um, you know, I don't know why we have a code like this. If you're on fire on water skis, I think if you just let go of the tow rope and you're, like, not on fire anymore. But anyway, there's a, there's a code for that. So, doctor, we've got to go ICD-10 because we need these codes. Now, I looked everywhere. I couldn't find any guys burning on water skis, but I did find some great ones involving snow skiing, uh, like B98.3XA. Uh, that's accident two honor involving a ski lift. Now, the next picture I'm going to show you was on the front page of the Vail, Colorado Daily, the Vail Daily. Um, and this was on the front page, and I hate to say it, this is, I promise, I swear, is a Texas pathologist on vacation. Uh, he was rescued unharmed, except for his pride, for obvious reasons. And you know, his kid's sitting next to him on the show going, I don't know what happened. You know, guy yelled, single, got on, fell off. Who knows? Anyway, he was rescued unhurt. Um, here's another good one. Bitten by other birds. Other birds initial encounter. Now, I'm talking about other birds. Not this bird, but other birds. Uh, by the way, there are codes for being bitten or struck by turkeys, geese, orcas, lizards, raccoons, all kinds of stuff. Now, this next code is my favorite ICD-10 code of all time. Doctor, we have to go ICD-10 just for the mere fact that we'll have this code to be able to use, which on any given day in your practice, you could probably use this ICD-10 code, um, probably for some of your staff, too. Who knows? But anyway, <laughs> I found a lot of good pictures for this one, uh, but it gives me an opportunity to tell another lame joke, so here you go. Bizarre personal appearance. Hope you all get in the picture. Guy goes to his doctor, doesn't feel well. Doctor looks at him, he's got a stalk of celery sticking out of one ear, a carrot sticking out of the other, and he's got an olive stuck up his nose, and the doctor says, ah, I know what's wrong with you. They're not eating right. <laughs> I love that joke. Anyway, seriously, we got to find ways to engage the providers. You don't want to be that unprepared practice because that exhibits inadequate documentation that leads to unspecific coding, that leads to lack of medical necessity, that leads to denied claims. So at the end of the day, providers hold the key to ICD-10 success. Now you got a lot of a lot of other things you got to do. So let's let's take a look at, at the other. Uh, things you have to do for the um, the ICD-10 implementation. We're, we're down to step four now. So we're going to pull up, uh, this is another software. This is our project management, our implementation software, um, basically step-by-step -step guide through an ICD-10 implementation. Um, by the way, it's the only web-based virtual consultant like it on the market, but uh, um, it's got all the impact assessment phases. But I want to just pull up the, the payer questions, the vendor questions, let's say. So here's the vendor questions. Uh, again, you've got to ask these hard questions. Uh, for example, not are you going to be ready, but when, by when is ICD-10 going to be deployed so we can start testing and training? Will there be downtime as a result of the deployment? Will we lose current customization? You know, my old software and my old practices used uh, MISIS, and it was terrible. Every time they'd, they'd push through a big upgrade, we'd lose our template customization. So that's a question you want to ask. You know, a lot, of, a lot of practices haven't even asked how much of this is going to cost yet, which, which blows me away. Uh, I'll give you an example of how scary this can be. Dr. Curtis Jernigan is a doctor in Kingsport, Tennessee, and, and I was on the Tennessee Medical Association's ICD-10 Roadshow this summer. And Dr. Jernigan came up to me at the break and he said, boy, I wish we didn't know about this sooner. We just got a bill from Allscripts for $110,000 for ICD-10 upgrade. Now, this was a big hospital system with a lot of doctors, but the point is, ask the question. And be, beware of the answer, because they might say, well, we're not going to charge you for the ICD-10 upgrade. That's free. 
but then they turn around and they charge it for template redesign, support, maintenance, training. So ask the question. You know, you're going to have to carry ICD-9 for a while because you're still going to be working ICD-9 claims well after the transition date. So uh, that dual track is going to be important also for those HIPAA exempt payers like work comp, auto insurance, disability. So these are questions you have to ask. And then the, the biggest question on the horizon right now is testing. You know, what are we going to test? How are we going to test? What's that testing going to look like? Uh, a vendor, are you going to schedule the testing with the clearinghouse or do we have to? So these are all important questions you got to ask. And then, and then finally, that fifth thing to jumpstart the transition, make sure you've got the ability to um, create deadlines and accountability. When you assign uh, a task, make sure you have the ability to um, you know, follow up and say, did you get the task assignment? Have you completed the task assignment? Um, I love this particular software because it gives us the ability to automate everything, and I, I, won't, I won't go through that, but uh, you don't need software to do it. This just helps you organize it. But again, you know, all these things that you have to do in, a, in an ICD-10 implementation, there are so many steps. So everywhere your an ICD-9 code currently touches, order entry, uh, paper, if you're still using paper, referrals, registries, registration, authorization, scheduling. All these, along with that in-house software system I showed you, have impact, so make sure those are addressed. Uh, and then the deadlines and accountability, nothing exists if you don't give it a date. So make sure you follow up on that. So anyway, um, you know, bottom line is with, with ICD-10, we're talking short-term pain, long-term gain. You've got the first six months are going to be challenging, certainly, uh, a lot of changes, but the long-term benefits are, are things we don't often hear about with ICD-10. Improved data should equal clinical improvement. So for example, if I asked any of you uh, to run a report in your EHR for how many of your patients had asthma, you could do that. But if I asked you to run a report for all of your patients with uh, you know, um, mild uh, persistent asthma due to tobacco use, you couldn't do that. But guess what? You could with ICD-10. So for example, when we're looking at, at code conversions, you know, we talked about converting your top 20 codes as one of those steps. Let's take a look at asthma, for example, 493.90. Um, to convert, there are three ways to do it. You can either do it out of code books. You can do it on the GEMS database that CMS developed, but just realize GEMS has some shortcomings, or there's some really good software out there, like, like well, I really like this one. Uh, but when you look at converting in those top 20 codes to demystify, and we look at asthma, now we know, wow, we can't just call it asthma. It's got to be mild, moderate, or severe. It's got to be intermittent or persistent. We've also got to identify these Z codes now that are required for most pulmonology and cardiology codes for tobacco use or exposure. So when you convert your codes and you create um, you know, resources, you, you create reference sheet for those conversions. This one's nice because you just print it out and there it is. Uh, but, but start doing this again to demystify. So just to, to kind of go back through the five steps, first, convert your codes like we just did. Second, create training, uh, training um, aids or tools to help your doctors understand what's going to be required of them. So you know, create a little flashcard. So now that we know what asthma looks like, if I wanted to create a flashcard for asthma, and I only wanted to capture uh, you know, those new documentation elements, a flashcard might look something like this. You know, make sure it's in a four by six format. You can laminate it. They can slip it in their lab coats. Uh, but there it is. If you did one of these a week for the next 40 weeks for your top 40 codes, by the time you got to the ICD-10 implementation date, you're going to be ready to go. So that's step two. Convert your codes. Create documentation training tools. Do some simple chart reviews like we talked about. Engage your payers and vendors. And make sure you create a system that tracks deadlines and accountability. So that's the top five steps. Uh, now a couple things, uh, and then we'll close. Um, more in benefits of ICD-10. I, I negotiate a lot of contracts as a consultant, and I, I went in unarmed before ICD-10. The insurance companies, the managed care companies, they have all the data. But with ICD-10, if you embrace the new specificity, I can now create accurate acuity level databases where I can walk in and I can prove that your patients are sicker than your colleague competitors down the block. And that should equate to more reimbursement. So again, ICD-10 is a good thing in the long term. Short term, total pain. Long term, there are some benefits. 
And we've already talked about value-based reimbursement, PQRS, and ACOs. Remember, your code set is, is your public face to the outside world. So uh, you want to embrace that specificity. At the end of the day, folks, this is just a project. You guys can do this. You just got to find a way to get started. And hopefully, with these five steps, we've given you achievable things you can do to get this done. Uh, if you just do the top five things, the rest of the project will fall into place. But it's a project. Those of you who have uh, organized complicated weddings or, or family reunions, uh, this is just another project. You can do it. Um, and now we'll open it up. Now there's a, a dashboard on your um, attendee uh, screen there that allows you to type in questions. So we've got some time left. And, uh, I'll, I'll take whatever questions you have. But I, I know some of the questions involve, hey, I really like that software. Where do I get that? So I wanted to give you the, uh, the, the URL to order and also a phone number uh, and an email address, info at icd10coach.com or 650-242-5442. Uh, it's super affordable. It's unbelievably affordable, a lot more than you think. And, and to my mind, why go reinvent the wheel? This gives you soup to nuts everything you need to accomplish an ICD-10 implementation. All the conversion, the chart reviews, uh, the implementation steps, impact assessment, everything. So do yourselves a favor. Don't try and do this on your own. Get that software. It's really cool. All right, I'm going to open up the question dashboard. And uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. So let's see what kind of question we got. Uh, let's see. Uh, if preauthorized diagnoses have to be ICD-10 by June, do we then bill with that preauthorized code for payment even though payers won't be ready for ICD-10 until 10-1? That's a great question to ask the payers. And in fact, that's one of the questions that's in the, the toolkit. Uh, you've got to start asking them, OK, if you're, are you going to start requiring ICD-10 codes on June 1st and post-October 1st when we actually conduct or perform the surgery? Is that same code still going to be used? Because they're, yeah, they they better be ready to go on October first. They're in big trouble. So I hope that answered your question too. Um, do the search words need to be in the same order as they're listed in ICD-10? No, the software is really cool. In fact, you can even use abbreviated words. Like uh, I looked up chronic obstructive pulmonary disease the other day. Um, I'll just show you. It's pretty. It's pretty neat. If you look up chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in ICD-9, you know. It's hard to believe, but even though the doctors chart it all the time, there's no ICD-9 codes for it. See, I'll show you. Search for ICD-9 for COPD, not there. Now ICD-10, they fix that. And we now have codes for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So yeah, not only do they not even have to be in the same order, you don't even have to spell them all out. Of course, we always chart um, uh, or code uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease so what were we using before? Well, what we were using before was asthma and bronchitis, as you can see. So anyway, it's a pretty slick conversion tool. We really like it. Um, OK, more questions. Um, let's see. Denny's audio dropped. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that, everybody. Will we get printout including links of the webinar today? Yes, Brown and Poland uh, has recordings of this webinar. And actually, they've got multiple recordings. So hopefully, we'll have one where my audio didn't drop off. But uh, yes, Connie, they do have uh, recordings of these. And, and I do want to set you up. The second phase of the Brown and Toland webinars are going to be hardcore implementation, where we're actually going to go step by step by step through every single thing you need to do. And it's probably going to be a two-part webinar series. Uh, but this just gave you kind of a taste and hopefully opened your eyes to the, the uh, amount of work that's due and, and help you get started. But the second series is all about, you know, for project managers and team members, OK, now we kind of know what to do. What exactly do we have to do? Uh, how do we create budgets? How do we uh, you know, monitor post-implementation metrics, all that good stuff? Uh, we're also going to do a, a kind of a, a parallel track for documentation and coding training for physicians and coders and staff as well. So be watching out for those. Um, What's the next question? Uh, do I have a webinar for internal medicine? We're just starting in the transition of the billing and electronic records. Is there a way a live person can help us with consultation? Yeah, ICD-10 coach, the number and website you have up on the screen, 
uh, is a great resource for you, and they can help you with a lot of this stuff. So I, I give them a holler. Uh, we currently use a super bill to fill out an ICD-9 code for the visit. It seems as though this is not practical in ICD-10. How will we document the codes? Great question. And I can tell you my very first um, ICD-10 consultation hunter was with a, a, a little F2HC in Clinton, Louisiana called RKM. And we converted their one-page super bill uh, into ICD-10. Their one-page, you know, even just the back page, you know how super bills look. It converted to 27 pages in ICD-10. So it's going to be pretty tough to have a super bill. So for that asthma example I gave, for example, we know now we can't just call it asthma. So on your super bill, you might write J45 asthma, J45 being the root code for asthma. Um, and then next to it, write things like uh, mild, moderate, severe, intermittent, persistent, and uh, tobacco use, yes or no. And that's, uh, you know, you're going to have to write that little letter so that the physicians can then just circle what they need. Uh, but that would be the, really the only way to do it. So, you know, again, J45 is the root code for asthma. Mild, moderate, severe, intermittent or persistent, tobacco, yes or no. Uh, so for a super bill, you know, if you're on paper, you might have super bills by organ system or body area of disease type. And that's going to be up to the front desk to hand out the right one, obviously. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Um, let's see, next question. Uh, do we need special software to convert ICD-10 codes or just use current EHR? You know, most EHR companies should have conversion software eventually, but 95% of them don't right now. Uh, they're, they've just been so buried in meaningful use stage two, they haven't given the emphasis uh, to ICD-10 that it really deserves. So they're they're all behind, and they'll admit that privately. So uh, you know, eventually they might have a conversion system like like I showed you today. Uh, but if they don't, you got to get one. Now you don't need software. You could use uh, books, but it, it, I will tell you it, it takes a long time to manually convert. I've, I've done lots of them. So that's all the questions, and that will conclude the the webinar. Again, my thanks to Brown and Poland. Thanks to you all for attending. I hope we opened your eyes a little bit today. Again, Brown and Tolan has taken a very aggressive stance in, in educating you about ICD-10. Uh, the clock's ticking, folks, so don't let too much more time go by without really jumping into this. It's a lot bigger than you think. So um, get ready get, and, and prepare, and it's a project. You can do this, and Brown and Tolan has a lot of resources to help you. And again, my apologies for the audio uh, snafu today. So thanks all for attending, and uh, this is Denny Flint, and um, I'll see you on the other side. Good luck.